Well, back to chapter 26 of Ezekiel. And as you turn there, I'm going to take this prophecy apart piece by piece with you. Because when Ezekiel wrote this, his prediction of chapter 26 was ludicrous to the people that were listening. It was so ridiculous that anybody would think that, that Tyre would fall, that Tyre, this, this impregnable fortress, would ever be defeated by anyone. It was absurd. How did God do it? How did God take the mistress of the seas, the seaport of the world, the land whose colony Carthage under Hannibal nearly conquered Rome? How did he take a city that flourished for 600 years in a location that made it impervious to attack? How did he destroy them? Well, the story of Tyre's doom originated in Ezekiel's prophecy as he wrote in around the year 570 B.C. Now, Tyre was destroyed in 332. So, 240 years before the event, God said how it was going to happen. And what we see are seven things, and you can look at these. Starting in verse 3, number one, there'd be a coalition. It wasn't a solo deal. Many nations would come against the city, it says in verse 3. Many. Now, one nation came at first, and that was Nebuchadnezzar. But Nebuchadnezzar couldn't finish the job. Because God wanted to make this an example for all time of what he thinks of pride and how he will flatten nations and rulers and individuals to the ground that are proud. Secondly, it was a complete destruction. Not just a coalition would do it, but it would be a complete destruction. Verse 4 says the actual site of the city would be left scraped clean. So God says it's going to be a complete destruction. It says that it was going to clear out all the debris to the point that fishermen could spread their nets. Now, if you know anything about fish nets, you know that you don't put it over jagged stuff because they'll catch and it'll tear open the net and then the fish will get through. They want an absolutely clean slate to put their nets out to dry so they don't get stinky. It was also going to be a, an extended campaign because it says in verse 6 that the suburbs all the daughter cities of Tyre. You see, here was this metropolis, but outside were these feeder cities, people that raised food for them, people that helped them in their shipbuilding, people that brought stuff to them. And so it wasn't just the city of Tyre that would go. It says that all of the daughter cities would be taken, the daughter villages, it says in verse 6, those which are in the fields working. Also, that Tyre would be absolutely conquered, it says in verse 6, through 11, that, that her walls will be knocked down, her, her uh, dust will cover those that are riding their horses, their hooves will trample. I mean, it was an absolute, it was an undeniable conquest. Then it said, verse 12, this is interesting, that the city of Tyre would be thrown into the sea. Now, that's, when God gives a prophecy, he doesn't vaguely speak. He says, he says, more than one nation is going to come. They're going to scrape the city. They're going to clear it out so the nets can be there. They're going to take all the daughter cities. They're going to conquer Tyre itself. Then they're going to pick it up and throw it in the sea. And finally, verse 14, the seventh element of the prophecy was going to be a cursed city. Never again rebuilt. A coalition is going to come, completely destroy. They're going to clear it. They're going to have a campaign against the outlying areas. They're going to conquer them. They're going to cast the city down. They're going to see that it's cursed of God and never again be rebuilt. Well, what happened? Nebuchadnezzar, and he's mentioned in verse 7, comes marching up and started hammering at the gates of Tyre. Now see, Nebuchadnezzar came from the top of the Fertile Crescent. He was on his way down to get Jerusalem. And he wasn't about to leave this city unscathed in his path because he didn't want them to attack him from the rear. And so... Nebuchadnezzar took the daughter cities of Tyre on the mainland, as foretold, in 585 B.C. as he was marching through to destroy the mop-up operation. In 586, he took Jerusalem. In 585, he comes back to Tyre so they wouldn't attack him from the rear. He, first of all, wipes out all the surrounding areas, all the cities that, that brought food into Tyre. Then... For months, he battered down the defenses of the city. And by the way, this was a massive, it would be like a castle right perched on the edge of the ocean. 
And right on the back side where the ocean was, all their ships were moored. And the front was just one big wall. No one in the ancient world was good on shipbuilding except the Phoenicians. And so nobody had boats back then in military ways. And so they just put their boats at the back and had their big walls up. And Nebuchadnezzar couldn't come around behind because he didn't have any fleet. And so he just hammered at the walls. But he had such a large army that he brought the full weight of his army, battered and lost so many men until at last he broke through the walls of the city. But when they broke through into the city of Tyre, they were all out in their boats going, he didn't get us, he just got the city. And they moved to a fortress they had built on an island offshore. And so all he did is ransack the town and burn it to the ground, and he left it a big heap of rubble, but the people of Tyre escaped a half mile offshore and never ceased their commercial enterprises. You know, critics would look at this and they'd say, ah, Bible didn't happen. They're still in operation. But you see, the prophecies of God were slumbering in the womb of time. And God said, but I didn't say that one person would conquer. I said that Nebuchadnezzar would start and he would conquer the city. But he said, I said a coalition would come and destroy and scrape off the rock. And so from 585 B.C., to 332 B.C., for 250 years, time marched on. Well, what's going to happen? Well, for 13 years, Nebuchadnezzar tried to take that island. He didn't have any amphibious assault vessel, and all he could do is just shoot arrows and send people out in little boats, but he finally gave up, and in 572 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar was off the scene. Tyre was just as proud as ever, and Nebuchadnezzar had won a moral victory, he, he wiped out the city and left it a pile, but Tyre was still proud as can be. Well, part of Ezekiel's prophecy had been fulfilled, but the Tyre known by the prophet Ezekiel wasn't anymore. But nothing had happened about the scraping down, the throwing down, the flatness, and the, the nets. And so it took more than just Nebuchadnezzar to fulfill the oracles of a Hebrew prophet he had never met. Tyre set about fortifying their city against would-be invaders. On their little island, they built uh, walls 150 feet high. That means you had to come on a boat and you looked up 150 feet at raining down rocks and arrows. And most people weren't very good in boats and they didn't know much about shipbuilding back then. And so it was just, it was just suicide to try and attack them. On top of that, they mined their harbor with underwater obstacles that would puncture and sink unwary ships. And they took the next 200 years to totally multiply their fleet until finally that island was just overflowing with vessels, a first-class navy. And for two and a half centuries, Tyre rested while Ezekiel's prophecies were germinating in God's time. Well, the year 332 arrives, a man that we only know by his first name, rises to power, Alexander, son of Philip of Macedon, who conquered the whole world in such short time. But he had a custom, and God was waiting for him. Nebuchadnezzar's method of conquest was this. He would destroy a city, pulverize it, and then he would scrape it up and move it off its foundation and dump it in a new location to show his utter destruction of that city. In 332, he comes... And he had just won a victory over the Persian army in 333 and flush with victory. He was on his way to take Egypt. And Alexander had no intention of leaving a powerful city-state like Tyre standing astride his supply lines. I mean, he was from up there in Babylon, and, and or he just conquered Babylon, and he was coming from Greece, and as he was coming down to Egypt, he wasn't going to leave anybody parked along the superhighway that could cut off his supplies and communication. And since he didn't have a navy that was anything to match tires, he decided to build a causeway from the mainland to the island. And so he looked around, where can I get some stuff to build a road, a bridge, a causeway out to that island? And he looked around and he says, wow, there's a pile of rubble. And so he scrapes off the foundations of the city of Tyre. And his soldiers take months and they take all that material until it's absolutely flat and they take it and throw it into the ocean. 
and they build a channel out to this island. Well, it doesn't stop there. I mean, they had their 150-foot high walls. And before the causeways were finished, Alexander's engineers had scraped the very dust, every bit of the old ruin, and thrown it into the sea. But those people on the island, the Tyre population, fought that desperately. They tried to halt the causeway of doom, but God's clock struck its hour. Nothing now could prevent their fall. Alexander's men made giant shields as shelters from the arrows and missiles. The foe was shooting at them. And they started coming forward with their causeway until it hit the island. And then retreating back, Alexander had built a 150-foot high platform mobile. And putting shields on the outside, his army pushed the platform forward. And you know the rest of the story. They went right over the top of the walls, and they invaded the island, and they killed every last person. They set afire the fleet. They ransacked the city. They murdered every last Phoenician they could find. And then he destroyed that city. And he scraped off the island city of Tyre is flat in his, it is his typical way, scraped it off flat and dumped the rest of the rubble into the ocean. And the prophecies of Ezekiel were fulfilled to the letter. Even though the engineers of Tyre had thought they were impregnable, even though their towers were unassailable from the sea, Alexander's troops from their tower looked right down over the walls and he destroyed the city, Tyre fell, and Alexander the Great had unwittingly fulfilled an ancient Hebrew prophet's words, because those words were the words of God. As the years went by, drifting sand converted Alexander's causeway into a peninsula, and to this day, fishermen, as I said before, if they're not getting shot at, spread their nets on this island. Look back at, at verse 3 of chapter 26. Because I'm against you, the Lord said, and I will cause many nations to come against you. The Babylonians and the Grecians, with all of their mercenaries, were the many nations, and God fulfilled that. They will destroy the walls of Tyre. Nebuchadnezzar did that. They'll break down her towers. Nebuchadnezzar did that. Uh, Alexander scraped her dust and made her like the top of a rock. Alexander made it a place for the spreading of nets. Nebuchadnezzar, verse 6, destroyed the daughter villages. Verse 14, Alexander finally made the whole area like the top of a rock, and it became a place for the spreading of nets. And to this day, it has never been rebuilt. You know, a mathematician by the name of Peter Stoner, who was a Christian, took the laws of, of statistics and statistical possibility and probability, what they do in casinos, you know. I don't know if you realize, casinos usually pay out about 98.8% of the money you put in. And so you put in $6 billion and you get back $5.8 billion. But the casino gets $200 million. I mean, it's a real neat deal. You just It's kind of like they're keeping a part of your money every time... And by the way, gambling is ridiculous and it's wasteful and it's ungodly, but I'm just saying that statistically they have computed how often they'll give a payout to keep people coming. And there are people that their whole life is doing those type of estimates. They do it in insurance. They say, you know, people are going to do this every so often. We'll insure them at this rate and make money. Well, Peter Stoner, this, this statistical mathematician, started to figure out what the possibilities would be that the seven prophecies concerning Tyre would all come true. Remember, when, when Ezekiel wrote those seven things that were going to happen, Tyre was the mistress of the seas, impregnable, there was no Nebuchadnezzar in sight, and definitely Alexander had not even been thought of. This is what he did, just with raw numbers. If such a prophecy would be fulfilled, each one would amount to a minimum of one chance in 75,000, each one of the seven but that each one of the seven would be fulfilled as they were stated was one in 5.76 octillion. You know how many that is? Well, Stoner said this. He said, if you took a silver dollar 
and put it into a pile of 5.76 octillion silver dollars. It would be like filling up our entire solar system from Pluto to the sun as one giant round ball of silver dollars and letting a child loose and telling them to pick the one with the red spot on it and they got five minutes to find it. That's what probability there is that these seven prophecies would all happen as they were predicted 240 years before the people involved were even alive. And Stoner went on to take the rest of the Bible and he said if you apply the same ground rules for the prediction against the destruction of Samaria, against Gaza and Ashkelon, against the destruction of Jericho, the Golden Gate in Jerusalem, the plowing of Zion, the enlargement of Jerusalem, Palestine, Moab, Ammon, Edom, and Babylon. The probability is out, the universe isn't big enough for the silver dollars for all those things to happen. You say, well, what are you telling us all that? Because those figures of probability are beyond our power to comprehend. Basically, what it's saying is that the Bible predicts the future with utter certainty. And we should trust God's word. And the Bible contains far more than the 11 prophecies treated by Dr. Stoner. And Isaiah 42:21 says, The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness' sake. He will exalt the law to make it honorable. God will keep his word.